Welcome to Halting Toward Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Ettinger and Brian Broom, and we are continuing our discussion of the era of restoration. I almost said reconstruction, which would be a huge <laughs> mistake. It would. Restoration. We are, we've come back from the Babylonian exile, and we have to decide what we're going to do. How, what's, what's the most important thing to do first? When you have to rebuild your entire city, where do you start? You set up Starbucks. <laughs> uh, you How are you going to rebuild society laws. without Starbucks? Yeah, really. Sorry, Brian, what was your option? Oh, you write a bunch of laws. Ah, uh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I'll do it. Um, you reconstruct the elaborate, divinely ordained liturgy because that's what changes the world. Mm -hmm. Or all of all of these are wrong, wrong <laughs> apparently. You inst did I say this already? You institute a biblically, explicitly biblical legal code, the level of civil government and family government, because it's all about bringing the world under God's dominion, which means yours. Not that either. Oh, apparently. rats! Um, um, you 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 set up museums. And no, before you do anything else, you do um, rock, paper, scissors. You have to figure mm. out who's in charge. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Having well, you elect a leader. Right, you elect a leader. Yeah. You know, it's like when you're stranded on a desert island. Mm -hmm. The first thing you do is pick a leader. I thought you mm. said what five books you brought with you. <laughs> <laughs> There's that too. I think we've had that discussion at an earlier time, so we won't repeat it, although it's fun. So... These are the things they had to decide when they came back. And our um, sarcasm, if you will, which, by the way, is a biblical concept. Uh, our friend David Farsham and I had a nice little discussion with um, a former student last night. She was concerned about sarcasm and its overuse and wrong use. And she's right to be concerned about its overuse <laughs> and wrong use. Yeah. But uh, David did a great job of explaining the nature of the thing and why it has biblical uses and and why it fits into life. And so if you were a target of any of our sarcasm, particularly mine, maybe you should move and not be there so you're not a target anymore. <laughs> and to be fair, I think that was some of the least sarcastic sarcasm that we've had on this podcast, <laughs> just because, you know, we're coming up with things that make sense according to a certain line of logic. Mm -hmm. And then we're saying, that's not the line of logic that we're going to follow. No, it's not. Now, all of those things that we we threw out there have their place in in the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. Some more pressingly than others, and some more pressing at particular times and circumstances, and at certain stages of maturity in the life of the church and at others. But we're going here back to the beginning. The children of Israel have been in captivity. Uh, we'd like to think that during that time... They laid aside all their idols, ignored all the worldly philosophies around them, and dove into the Word of God and absolutely mastered it so that when they came back, sin, idolatry, compromise, all of that would be completely gone, and they really, they're going to get right to business serving God. They did, that's not exactly the way it worked. I mean, given, given Israel's history, what they end up doing is not that bad. But it's not what you might hope for, as, as is the case with many of our aspirations. We're going to, I'm going to have a family, I'm going to educate my children, and I got this plan and that plan. It's going to be Bible centered and Christ centered, and I'm going to have the most wonderful children who are going to set the world on fire for Christ. Yeah, um, and then it's two in the morning and you're changing a diaper, and somehow <laughs> all of those grand ideas <laughs> are gone. <laughs> mm, yeah, that. Or, you know, I'm going to start a school, a university, um, some kind of Christian educational think tank. And we're going to spread, we're going to publish books and do blogs, and we're going to spread our vision of the kingdom. Education will bring in mm -hmm. the new Christian world order, the Latter-day Glory. And uh, that is so thoroughly Lockean and pagan that, I mean, that that's the, that's the thinking of the public school system. Just because we do it in the name of Jesus does not help any, really. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's more dangerous because of that. Right. Now, but again, Christian schools, home schools, Christian universities, they all have their place, Christian mm -hmm. seminaries. 
I guess they have their place. Um, <laughs> disenchanted with most of them. But there, I know there are some good ones out there. So, you know, we, we look at these things and they have their, they do have their time. They do have their place. But when we start hanging the future of the kingdom on this one thing that I have found, or to put it differently, upon this one ministry that I'm at the heart of, we need to start looking a little suspiciously at such folk and say, mm -hmm. you know what? I don't think Jesus planned to hand the king, hang the kingdom of God on this moment in history when you were here with your new vision. It just got a bad feeling about this. And when the children of Israel returned from captivity, there, there's no record that anybody said, okay, I've been working on this book for you know the last 40, 50 years. It's all ready. We're going to have scribes and copy it out so that everyone can read the plan. And we're all going to be on the same page, literally. And we're, this, this is going to be our vision. Nobody seemingly did that. The book they had, oddly enough, was the Bible. They had an almost completed Old Testament. And that is crucial to our understanding of this era. But as far as merely human books are concerned, none are mentioned. They may have had some. And we know that during the years that follow, the whole Apocrypha is going to appear in some form or another. Mm. But it's hardly inspired. And it's some of it is more valuable than others. Some of it is just mildly entertaining, <laughs> if not laughable. But yeah, that's that's not there. Eventually, the, the such schools as they have turned into the rabbinic schools that produce Phariseeism. We, anyway, the point is, what did they do? And there are two things. And the first one's easy, particularly for me, to jump over. But I, I want to um, underscore it nonetheless. The first thing when they came back into the land was, so the priests and the Levites and some of the people and the singers and the porters and the Nathanims dwelt in their cities and all of Israel in their cities. They found houses and built houses and started farming and gardening and raising food and making a living making a living that was the first thing and it would be easy to say well that's so unspiritual don't they know that the promises of god the gospel all of that comes first well yes and they do get called on that later when god says you've yeah. built your fine houses and mine is in ruins yeah but there is also a recognition by God and his prophets. And the section I read was from Ezra chapter 2, verse 70. There is a recognition by Ezra and, and the other prophets that, okay, you, you, you kind of do have to eat and you have to <laughs> yeah. sleep someplace. You, you, you can't do God's work on a completely empty stomach, nor naked. And and when, when Jesus came and talked to his generation about the Sabbath, these are things he realized, mm -hmm. things he enforced. Yes, the worship of God and, and the gospel message is terribly important, but the gospel itself is for the whole man. And mm -hmm. if we take our, our little flock of believers and starve them and sleep deprive them and give them no settled abode, good things are not going to happen. There, there is a time, even on the Sabbath, for going out and getting some food. And uh, as, as, as we think about the worship of God, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. And the institution of formal worship also is for man's good and welfare. If, he, if he's starving and sunburned and dehydrated on the verge of getting some horrible sickness because he's so weak because he wants to do the spiritual thing first, it's not going to work. But all of that gets one verse. They came <laughs> back and they did that. But then in chapter three, with, with, with minimal support, they, they got their farms and their animals and such up and going, they have places to live, we're told this. When the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. Then stood up Jeshua, or Joshua, or Yeshua, the son of Josedek, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shaltiel, and his brethren, and built an altar of God to offer burnt offerings thereon 
as it's written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And they set the altar upon his bases, for fear was upon them because of the people of those countries. And they offered burnt offerings thereon unto the Lord, even burnt offerings morning and evening. They kept also the feast of tabernacles, as it was written, and offered the daily burnt offering by number according to the custom, as the duty of every day required, and afterwards offered the continual burnt offering, both of the new moons and of all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated, and of every one that willingly offered a free will offering of the Lord. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not laid. They gave money also unto the masons and the carpenters, and meat and drink and oil unto them of Zidon and to them of Tyre, to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the Sea of Joppa, according to the grant that they had of Cyrus, king of Persia. And that's what they accomplished in their first year. Now, as we look at that, first of all, the seventh year, a seventh month is, is important. Mm -hmm. um, the festivals of Israel were laid out over a seven-month period, and the seventh month, the month of Tishri, uh, originally on, on, on the creation calendar was the beginning, well, Tishri 1 was the day the world was born. But back at the Exodus, God had shifted the calendar um, so that the first month became the seventh and the seventh the first. So when it comes time to worship, they pick that month, that month has trumpets, New Year's Day, Rosh Hashanah, and it has the Day of Atonement, and it has tabernacles. It's the culmin and it's the end of harvest. It's the culmination of everything, the seventh month, the think finale, think um, uh, climax, think culmination of everything. And at the very first day of the month, they all gather together. And their focus, the first thing they do, unlike all of our previous suggestions, is they raise the altar and they offer the lamb. The altar goes back to Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. From the beginning of human history, from the fall, God instituted the ordinance of sacrifice. And the slain lamb pointed, well, to a number of things. Um, to come before God, I am so defiled by my sins that I need someone, I, I deserve to die. That would be counterproductive because if I'm dead, I really can't serve God. So I need somebody, something, somehow to come and stand in my place and take the death blow, endure the suffering, pay the penalty. And in a picture, God put a lamb there. You, you lay your hands on the lamb, you confess your sins, and then you kill the lamb, cut its throat, bleed it out. You cut it up and you offer the fat, the innards of the lamb, and, and, and it ascends in flame before God, and God is pleased. I kill the animal because I should die. And in doing that, I am saying, but I want to live and serve you. So, I'll, Lord, I, by, by this act of atonement, I'm giving my life to you, and I'm submitting to your claim on my life. This, this is the primeval, the primordial, the, the first, the simplest act of worship. It involves the preaching of the gospel. God ordained it, so the message is his. Adam and Eve did not think it up. Cain and Abel did not come up with it. Abel did not invent, well, what God like? I know a dead animal. Um, and, and so they are submitting to God's own plan and decree, and they're returning to him that which is his. But in this, there is a preaching of the gospel that God has ordained. Believe this, submit, even if you don't completely understand it, do this, and, and in your actions, preach the gospel to yourselves and to all that see. This is my plan of salvation. And for 4,000 years, that was the most basic and central preaching of the gospel. And so when the children of Israel come back, that's where they begin. They start, at, they go back to the beginning, and it's an altar and it's a lamb. Now, we'll, we probably should talk about, well, then that means we should have sacrifices today. Why don't we have sacrifices in our churches? Well, it's not a bad question if you don't know anything. See, in our churches, the preaching of the gospel takes the form primarily not of the Holy Supper, but of words. Mm -hmm. 
because in the Old Testament, God preached through shadows and types and dim images. In the Old Testament is a mystery story. God has a great secret wrapped up in the councils of the Trinity. The councils are forever. And he has given hints and foreshadowings, like a good mystery writer does, but he hasn't told the whole story yet. He's not ready to reveal it until Jesus comes to earth. And then piece by piece, little by little, Jesus lifts the veil, and yet no one really gets it until Easter morning. <laughs> and, and But after once once it's obvious, you don't need the pictures anymore. Yeah, it's kind of amazing how the New Testament shifts gears from the story unfolding, the fulfillment of all the prophecies and images and foreshadowing into, all right, let me explain it to you because you <laughs> missed it. Like here's here's the, the detective telling us the, then mm -hmm. you went here and you did this, and then you went here and you did this, and this was so that later this could happen. You know, we get so many epistles just explaining <laughs> The solution to the mystery. And then finally at the end, it's like, oh, not all the mystery is gone. Remember, remember all those images? More to come. More Setting to us go. up for the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, um, oh, it's, it's, it's the last battle that, that episode of, um, the Chronicles of Narnia that never happened. But <laughs> it, it does, it, it ends much like you just said. Uh, they had come to the end of the story, which was the beginning of the great story, the next story, which has no end in which every chapter is better than the one before. But the New Testament is a radical change. And some people, we, we easily fall into two errors, not seeing any connection to the Old Testament, like God suddenly developed amnesia or came up with, suffered some kind of a multiple personality experience so that our God is so completely different that we don't even have to open the Old Testament. It has nothing to do with us, nothing to speak to us about. We can just start with the Gospel of John and we're good. The other mistake is to say, well, God gave us all that, so pretty much it's all really still in place. Maybe we spiritualize a little here and there, but if they did it in the Old Testament, we should probably find a way to do it in a Christian form now. I don't like either of those ditches. <laughs> yeah, th th those are those are unpleasant ditches, and and they are attractive exactly because there is a little truth in both of them, mm -hmm. and it's uh, simpler mm -hmm. than finding the wisdom in between. You know, yep. um, you know, we, well, I, and I think I'm not alone, <laughs> would have liked it if God had written a kind of um, manual laid out, Roman numeral one, A, one under A, small a <laughs> under one, which explains line by line, step by step in confessional formatting or that of some of the more rigorous system, systematic theo theologians, everything we could ever think of and just spelled it all <laughs> out. Okay. Not this, but that, not that, but this. Here's you go. Walk right down this aisle. I know you're going to have trouble with this one. So... Here's here's where bowing plays a part in the new covenant. <laughs> here's where tongues does and doesn't. And you, know, and you just go down the list of all circumcision and baptism, Lord's Supper and the, the, the Passover feast. What, step by step, explain absolutely everything so that we can never go astray or make mistakes. <laughs> that would be nice. <laughs> we think so, but God didn't. <laughs> yeah. And so we have God to. God would screw that up too. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we, we would find. We, we already have a very the straight ambiguity. Yeah. We already have a fairly straightforward set of things that we're yeah. told to do, and we already have trouble with that. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. <true. laughs> there, are, there are so many things that are just you know. We we in Bible class the last couple of days we've been talking about finding the will of God, and, and, and the easy and frightening thing is in most cases. It is it hard? <laughs> Shall I cheat on tomorrow's test? And my students say, no. Shall I marry an unbeliever? No. Shall I lie to my parents about my grades? No. Okay. So, should, <laughs> you so you know God's will for your life. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it pretty much came to that. It came down to, okay, but the only thing left is, and I asked them, what are the two things, the two most important things that people generally want to be told by God? At least they think they do. And they what got career it. I should take yep. and who I should marry. Exactly. Yeah. Years ago, one of my 
one of my early students said, wouldn't it be great if when you were born, you found tattooed on your hands from the womb, your calling, your career, and on the other, the name of the person you're going to marry? <laughs> you know? <laughs> that would take a lot of the romance out of the <laughs> courtship process. <laughs> like, oh, match, cool, high five. That'd be great until yeah. you get told, you see like, oh, Jane Doe, there's a lot of those. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which one? <laughs> Zalapruda Kanalikov. I'm never <laughs> going to find her ever. Uh, but you're right, and 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 it's we can we can quibble about, but no, it, it'd be easy. You just look her up in the phone book, or now you do an Amazon search, and how, and 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 she'll find that she has your name, and so and if it doesn't have your name, then it's the wrong one. <laughs> so you pass on her, and you keep going, and then once you found each other, you, you know you shake hands, and it's and it's good, or kiss, or whatever. Um, <laughs> But the way God has made us, that's not, as you say, the romance is gone. And, and romance both on the emotional, romantic level and on the literary level. It's got storytelling that's boring, childish, and confusing, although clear in some ways. But okay, here you two are going to get married. Uh, go into this room and talk over life. And uh, when you come out, we'll we'll do the ceremony. <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> Don't we get a say in this? Why? God God told you wanted to know who you were going to marry. It's right on your, like the mark of the beast. It's right in your hand. Um, <laughs> yeah, beast. Um. Well, that's a, points to another reality of the gospel that you can know all the right things mm -hmm. and have all the right words and your heart might not be won over. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's essentially what what God has done for us. He said, look, I made you. I am the one who can fulfill you, who can make you who you were made to be. I can satisfy all of your needs and all your desires. And yet we still rebel. <laughs> what is with that? Yeah. Um, using and this is, this is also very much a tangent, but so I will keep it short. But I also think the two things that we want most to know from God, uh, generally in our youth, is the two things that Adam wanted to know. Mm. He he was given uh, his job, and he was given his wife. Right. We want the same thing. We want the special yeah. <laughs> treatment Adam got. <laughs> <laughs> Can't we go back to the beginning? Can't we be in paradise again? Well, you see, we walked out of that one. Yeah, and we can't all be uh, the not, first. Not under our own choice either. <laughs> <laughs> it's more like uh, walking with a prod at our back. You no. Know, uh, and, and so, as as we look at scripture, it, it has it's organic in its revelation. God does know everything we need to know, and He does tell us everything we need to know. But He unfolds it in terms of the life of the New Covenant Church from its infancy to, well very young maturity. He gets it to childhood, maybe, and, and and reveals himself largely in terms of the problems that individual congregations had, in some cases, individual mm -hmm. persons. Uh, he does not give us a systematic theology. He does not give us a detailed commentary on the Old Testament. He doesn't give us an um, inspired book on biblical theology. He gives us letters and and would think of them as biographies and histories that address the reality, the historical reality of God stepping into our world, fulfilling his promises and changing everything. And now we have to come and learn and think and meditate and talk to each other and share, yes, that, no, not that. Well, you're onto something, but how about this? Oh, that's brilliant. That's the heresy of the first century. Let's not go there. <laughs> that I've never heard that before, but I think that's it's pointing to Jesus. I think that's good. You know, the things we do as we start doing deep Bible study yeah. and, and learning theology. And although sometimes we have trouble understanding exactly why, we we need to confess up front that God planned it. And therefore, it is the best thing for us. And it is that which will bring the most glory to God. So all our little plans of if God had only done it different, <laughs> well, are and, are self idolatries. And it's also, it's very much a a thing I think motivated by a kind of laziness mm. and a lack of willing to go through conflict or struggle, mm -hmm. uh, even if it's not struggle against 
sin per se. It's just I, I'm thinking about the development of theology over two thousand years. Mm. How much work went into that, and how oh. like just just even even apart from sin being like the sinful temptation towards laziness in the work, it's something that takes a lot of time. And sometimes you were drawing on people who made distinctions and discoveries, discoveries loosely termed here, <laughs> uh, before you, even centuries before you. Mm-hmm. Uh, even the reformers spent uh, a, a, like insane amount of page space uh, dedicated to pointing out, we're not the first people to think these things. <laughs> yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, these are the church fathers that agree with us. Calvin spends like a ton of time doing that. Yeah. Um, but it it is a temptation that I think everyone faces at some point in their life anyway, towards primitivism, mm. where you essentially mm-hmm. say, well, it would have been so much better to just go back to the 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 good old days, the simple times when, you know, uh, you know, the good old days of uh Corinth. The church in Corinth uh, (laughs) before Paul's first letter to them. Great times, no problems. Everything was great then. Uh, And that's just not wise. We've been given a treasury of knowledge and the wisdom through the ages that we should be willing to draw upon. (laughs) But as you say, it takes work. Mm Mm-hmm. And discernment. Uh, and discernment and, and, and a humility before God, a humility to say, I don't know everything. And it's not all about me. And just because I don't like it doesn't mean it's not true. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are some of the things. Some of the things I've been seeing in my my students this year. I got a great class this year. They're, they're, and, I, and I'm seeing a real desire to know the Word of God from kids out of all kinds of liturgical and, and confessional backgrounds or non-confessional as the case may be. And, and, and by and large, the older kids and some of the younger ones are really, really getting centrality of the doctrine of Christ, justification by faith, that we listen to the Bible and do what it says and believe what it says no matter what. But I also occasionally see this struggle with, and sometimes it, appear, it appears more often in the other classes than in Bible, but I, I see it in Bible too, yeah, I could have done better on this Bible test, but I was lazy. I, I, I'm given a chance to memorize right now they're learning the Ten Commandments. But that's hard. That has big words. You're having us do it in the, in the old King James, and there are these and thou's. You know, it's just, and it's, it's a lot of verses. Right now it's one, the first through the third commandment, I believe. Now, those students who grew up where the churches recite the Ten Commandments once a month or even every Lord's Day, they strangely enough have no trouble with this, um, except maybe shifting from the, from the uh, if they learned them in the New King James, I would prefer they recite them. My goal was so we could all recite them together in unison. So we've always mm-hmm. done the Old King James, but a couple have come and said, can I do New King James? And I said, sure, that's fine. Just don't tell, I'm not telling anybody this. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the point is... They, despite their zeal for learning the Bible, they too face what we all face. It's hard. Mm-hmm. Memorization is hard. Not not only in the strict sense of memorizing Bible verses, but holding concepts and definitions in your mind. Over the last few years, uh, all of our teachers in the upper grades keep teaching the doctrine of justification by faith. To the last year, I think it was, or maybe it was the year before, I cannot remember. I w- went through it, taught it. And in our high school, we have uh, group leaders responsible for small groups of other students, younger students. And so I had all of the group leaders one by one explain it in case I wasn't clear somehow. And they, and then having heard it from me, at, you know, we'd been t- talking about it for a week. I summed up, the group leader summed up, and I said, now. All of you, take take out a piece of paper. Explain the doctrine of justification by faith. And the horrible thing was there were about four or five students who did not know what it was. Uh, Similar story. um, I was together with our headmaster, was confronting a young man who'd been a student in our school for years, um, 
possible, I don't remember when he came in, maybe from the beginning, but certainly for many, many years. And so he had heard the doctrine of justification by faith over and over and over again. But he had done some bad things, and he was on his way out. We were going to have to ask him to at least not come back to classes. We were very near the end of the year. But we wanted to reach his heart, and so I asked him, so do you understand justification by faith? And he looked at me, that kind of blank puzzled look, and he said, oh, and he brightened up, oh, is that when you draw that heart on the board? <laughs> That's all he remembered. Hmm. Didn't know why it was a heart, didn't know what it meant, couldn't explain justification by faith. And he was a senior. Hmm. Men and women, boys and girls out there, learning the Bible takes effort. Now, the nice thing is, like all of the things that we love and enjoy, the more you love and enjoy it, and the more you know, the easier it gets, to a mm -hmm. point at least. Uh, you, you, you both can give me examples of this, but I'll give you one and you can, you can follow. How many uh, children know the history of Middle Earth for all three ages <laughs> with all of the major characters, their background, their race, their, you know, everything? How and many no one children does David Freshman have? <laughs> <laughs> uh, can you think of other such things where people just by osmosis, as it were, have picked up vast amounts of knowledge just because mm -hmm. they loved it? Anyone who's read Brandon Sanderson novels. <laughs> okay. Tell me, tell, tell me about mm -hmm. Brandon Sanderson. Uh, yeah, he's, he's a fantasy author and he's mm -hmm. written a series that takes place in a... I'll, I can be the, the case example here, actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, it takes place in the Cosmere, which is a collection of different planets, each of which has uh, more or less its own demigod ruler. Hmm. And each demigod ruler has a sliver of divinity that allows for each planet to have a unique magic system based on it. And... People go ham. They they talk about theories and the way that these different worlds interact with each other. As mm -hmm. some of the characters are, you know, called world hoppers, and there's just there's politics between the different quote unquote gods yeah. and all this, and people just go crazy because they love these stories and yeah. they're they're entertaining and they're fun and they're deep and they have emotional connection to these characters. But yeah, like to to your points, like they can do all of that, but Oh, scripture, that's boring. It's dusty. It's dry. So hard to remember. Um, Emily, you got an example? From myself, 1960s, no, no. name that tune. <laughs> 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 if you've got a British Invasion Pandora station on, I can probably tell you the the title of the song, the group, and what the album cover looks like. I probably can, and it's pretty sad. <laughs> that's, um, wow. <laughs> I only yeah, just and, found out about the Velvet Underground this week, so. <laughs> but that's Velvet something Velvet I I didn't set out to learn those things, you know. No. It was like I put on a radio station to listen to, and that's what happened. Is now I have all this useless knowledge. Yes. Um, how many times have I read the Psalms through? Many, many times. But how many can I recite from memory? Mm. Maybe less than a handful, like on a good yeah. day. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can still do, obviously, 23 that everyone could do, I would hope. Yeah. Uh, I think I can still do 1 and 2 and 72 and most of 110, and I'm running out real fast. What about 121? I, I lift my eyes. Oh, to the hills, whence yeah. cometh my help, my help cometh from the Lord. I don't know all of it. Mm -hmm. um, my help is from the Lord, the, make, the maker of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. He will not suffer your foot to be moved. He that keepeth Israel will neither slumber nor... S I'm faking it here. I don't, <laughs> yeah. I don't know it all. Um, and and that's of course, is the point here. Shouldn't I after all this time? I know hymns because mm -hmm. I was raised singing them. Not yeah. Psalter selections, but hymns. Some, I know some Psalter things from when I was fairly young. Our church began singing more of those. Funny thing, when my oldest daughter, who attends Baptist Church and is playing piano there, she comes home and she practices. And I think she was rather surprised at first when she started practicing hymns that she wasn't familiar with, but she'd be playing them and I'd start singing them. Mm. <laughs> Things I have not sung since I was a child. 
but yeah. they were ground into my mind there at my early church and then more particularly uh, in my Christian school because we couldn't afford hymn books for the school. We just borrowed old, worn out Baptist hymnals. <laughs> and that's what we sang our chapel songs from. <laughs> and so I knew a lot of it. And then I'd listen to a lot of Christian radio when I was a teenager. And so when she hit the the more, uh, the later um, Bill Gaither kind of things, I would know those mm. too. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes she'll just sit down, Dad, do you know this one? And I probably know nine out of 10 of what she's playing. And it's it's great. It's a great way of, of communicating and bonding with her. But I, I would wager that not everybody who had my experience necessarily learned them the way I did and wouldn't have been better if I had been taught to sing the metrical Psalms and to, or even to chant the exact words of scripture. What you, what you pick up when you're young and you're immersed in and you learn to love and you hear over and over again on a daily basis, you begin to learn. And yeah, it's and the things you work. learn by accident are the things that stick the longest. Yeah, very, very often so. Which means you need to put yourself in a place where you accidentally hear a lot of scripture. Right. <laughs> that <laughs> reminds me of the story our, our friend Sam told. Do you remember that on our Christian education episode where his daughter was that. like two? Uh-huh. Go ahead. And she wanted to go outside, but it was raining. And mm-hmm. so she's like, Daddy, I want to go outside. Well, however, a two-year-old would say that. It wasn't like that. But he's <laughs> like, no, we can't go outside. And she says, well, why? Because it's raining. Well, Why? Ask God. I don't know. <laughs> God, very God and very God, begotten, not made, being of one son. Because they're listening and they learn. Yeah. They learn by accident. Yeah. We, um, my, uh, well, my middle daughter used to wander around when she was like two or three and, and would look at us and say, Solomon, Daddy? Yes, Haley. Jesus is God. Yes, he is, dear. <laughs> I, over and over, actually. But the, in terms of memory, Emily still, I think, beats us all, my Emily. She, um, we, we asked her, I don't remember even what it was. It might have been Psalm 23. She, we, she started to say it or something, and we asked her to say it, and she was able to, which kind of surprises. And then I thought, well, where has she heard that? She's, okay, she picked it up in church because we never taught it to her. What else is she picking? Emily, do you know this? I believe in God the Father, Almighty Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ. Only begotten Son. Like, wow. This was like three. She was like three. Wow. We never taught her. She just heard it over and over and over again. Yeah. There, there, there's the old line. Oh, rock and roll can never bother me because I don't listen to the lyrics. Why can you recite them all then? <laughs> <laughs> uh, th- there are ways of learning things, but you need... To have a love or an interest, or at least not a horrid aversion to the process. And so there are, there are many things we can do to, and, I, and I'm retroactively following back our thought and, 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 and conversation trail to how in the world did we get here? Because <laughs> for a while, I actually lost it. But the, the point where all this came from is that God designed his revelation in such a way that it organically works as we work through our lives and our responsibilities as Mm -hmm. husbands and wives, friends, parents, church members, people working at our jobs. What he has said fits what we need to hear and how we need to hear it. He did not come and say, now listen here, the dispensation is changing, the old the old order passeth, the new order, you know, here's the things you're not going to do anymore, here's the things you're going to still do, here are the things that are going to be tweaked, good, now you got it down, go do that, that's what this is, because it's not all about that. It's all about knowing God and the person of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, Which oddly enough happens in dialogue. Yeah. Yeah. Not necessarily monologue. <laughs> God speaks, well, but God then he expects a response. Prayer. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Mm-hmm. And so getting all the way back to Ezra, and so God instituted sacrifice as the old covenant form, the central form of preaching the gospel, because he wasn't ready to explain it all in words. And the response, but the response of God's people was one, yes, offer the sacrifice, and then two, raise prayers of thanksgiving of praise and of supplication out of your heart using the words that God has already written in the Psalms and in other prayers, and then tweaking them and and developing them for your needs and your 
current circumstances in an organic way. And, and this is where the Christian life starts. It starts with God revealing himself in the gospel to us as individuals where we are, and then we respond, and we respond with our minds and our hearts and our words. And yes, the emotions follow along in there someplace, but they're not primary. Uh, unless you want to consider love for God as a primary emotion, but it's love, love for God is so much more than simply a good feeling. That's part of it, but it's not by any means the whole of it or even the most important part of it. It's a commitment and a dedication and an acceptance of who God is and a bowing yeah. before him. Accepting his reality, say, Lord, I am so glad you are God and you are the kind of God you are. Yeah. Uh, uh, we, we need to be able to say that. Thank you, God, for being you. Not like he had a choice in the matter. <laughs> He's God by nature. He is what he is necessarily. And that's so wonderful for us. And we can say to him, thank you. <laughs> it's also really good for us because it means that his mercy for us is something that continually flows out of him. Mm -hmm. yes. We don't have to worry that he's going to be like, well, I decided not to be merciful to you anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm getting tired of this. This is, this is old shtick. I'm going to try something. I'm going to be a different person today. Thank well, you. yeah, and I, I also think, too, like we, we live in such a, and, and maybe this is just like the most stereotypical way to refer to our society, but we live in a very therapeutic society. Oh, yeah. The idea is, is, is simply putting things out of their proper order, their proper perspective, mm -hmm and making them primary when they're secondary or even tertiary. Mm -hmm. Our moment-to-moment -moment emotional experience of God is going to be variable yes. because we are variable creatures. Mm -hmm. The thing that we should be looking toward for our assurance, for our hope, and for our certainty that God will hold us, it shouldn't be how much we love Jesus mm, that day, mm -hmm. how much we love God the Father that day, because mm -hmm. that is going to be variable because we are sinful creatures. We never love yeah. God with all of our heart and all of our mind and all of our mm -hmm. soul and all of our strength. So if that's the standard, which it is, which Jesus fulfills on our mm -hmm. behalf, then we're already lost because yeah. we don't love Jesus with all of our heart, mind, soul, right. and strength. And so... What I'm getting at is, regardless of names, whoever's saying, there's more than just one person who says this, um, is don't make the side thing the main thing. Keep mm -hmm. the main central point, the main central point, which is Christ's having fulfilled the law for us. Otherwise, you're just going to end up with a mini law of your own that you can't fulfill, and it's going to lead right. to things like burnout and depression and anxiety and yeah. non-assurance. And more yeah. sin because you yeah. you think oh I've already I've already lost the plot so I I'm lost there's no hope for me and and, and you are fundamentally operating in the flesh and your own ability yeah. to maintain whatever spirituality you think God wants and which means you have unplugged from Christ and His Spirit so what's left except more flesh mm -hmm. and the works of the flesh are manifest which are these adultery fornication idolatry yeah. you know all that whole list. So yeah, it, it's in in the name of loving Jesus, it can be a very deadly thing. Yeah, when when we lose the objectivity of who God is, of the God that is, the God who's there, mm -hmm. and His revelation of Himself and His Son and of His Son in Scripture. If, if we don't, if that's not our starting point. If our starting point is how we feel about all this, then things will be very bad for us. And I appreciate yeah. your, you know, primary, secondary, tertiary. That's sort of what um, Zerubbabel and Joshua were dealing with. Notice that they were afraid. They were enemies. They probably sent in spies and maybe some formal, and later we know they sent in formal messengers. They knew there were hostile forces out there. They knew that those, fo those forces could hire assassins. They could hire mercenaries. They could gather armies. They could mess with their their cases in in Cyrus's court, um, and they were these were a poor people. They didn't have much. They were just back, you know, subsistence farming, and yet they come together to do the one objective thing: build the altar, offer the lamb, and call on God, the God they don't always known because He was revealed in their book. And we're not aside from that, we're not told exactly how they felt about this. Uh, we're not told of any great um, 
emotional sort of revival. The revival consisted of preach the gospel with the one central act that got set up in the Old Covenant. Uh, presumably, there was a lot of you know praise and prayer and such, but even that really isn't mentioned. And and they they did, as we're told, what they did throughout the rest of that seventh month. They observed um, Rosh Hashanah trumpets and they observed tabernacles. But what we're told is they offered the sacrifices. We're not told, for instance, uh, to what degree they blew trumpets on trumpets. We're not told. Uh, whether or not they they dwelt in tabernacles, on tabernacles. In fact, when we run into this again in Nehemiah, it sounds like they didn't. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, they, the one thing on all of these festival days, which had some really cool ceremonies and liturgies going on, the one thing they were faithful to is they preached the gospel through sacrifice. Mm -hmm. They didn't even observe the Day of Atonement, as far as we can see, uh, Yom Kippur, because, well, there's this problem. They don't have an ark, mm -hmm. and they don't have a temple. They don't have yeah. a veil. They couldn't. They they might set it aside as a day of fasting and introspection and repentance, but aside from that, the the whole offering of the goats and such, or the and the scapegoat, they they couldn't do that. So the emphasis here again is not on feeling. It's not on cultural expression. It's not on the beauty of the music and how it moved everybody. It's let's preach the gospel the way God told us to in all of the ways and all the occasions he told us to, and trust that our enemies will not come and kill us while we're doing it. <laughs> you know, yeah. for a new generation who's just back from captivity, that sounds kind of like uh, a step down. <laughs> That's a big he, trust. Yeah. God, yeah. God knows what he's doing. This is not kind of what we expected. But one step at a time, one sacrifice at a time, one lamb at a time, we will do this. And God will do what God will do. Uh, and, and so our lesson here, again, is the centrality of gospel worship. Not worship as mere liturgy. Mm -hmm. Not how fancy can we make it. Not worship as moving people emotionally with our glitzy singing. Not how and traditional it, we can make it. Uh, how traditional we can make it, or how non-traditional we can make it, because we don't want to be old fogies wrapped up in the traditions of the past. We need to be new and relevant, and you synthesizers, because, oh, wait, this isn't the 80s anymore. We don't do that, do we? Um, <laughs> no, we're over Moogs. <laughs> also saxophone solos. We're yeah. done with those, too. Oh, are we? Oh, rats. I was going to like them. Uh, you and the saxophone players. <laughs> Oh, my, my daughter wants, my middle daughter wants to learn the saxophone. Her, she, her treat to herself when she got through grad school was going to be saxophone lessons. Now she's deciding she's not going to grad school. She's going to teach at our school. Oh, cool. Oh, there we go. Yeah. That's great. So she might be learning the saxophone a lot sooner than we thought. And I think I'm <laughs> going to tell her, you learned it outside. <laughs> but learn it, please. Well, on that jazzy note, <laughs> oh, we hey, should wrap up. I've not done my job of keeping us on task, on outline, or on time, but I'm I'm starting again now, <laughs> imperfectly. Um, but we should have some recommendations. I think, given our discussion, we can all go in on re-recommending the whole Christ by Sinclair Ferguson. Yes. Mm -hmm. But let's As add usual. to that, shall we? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we should we should compile the list of things that we recommend every single week because it's like <laughs> that and that hideous strength and um, Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Baking, yeah, funny. Yeah. yeah, funny thing. Just before we started, my wife said, "You guys really need to make a list of all the things you recommended, so you're not constantly recommending the same things." <laughs> well, we did. <laughs> they were we show tried. notes. <laughs> they were in the show notes. There was an attempt. <laughs> yeah. Well. Actually, so the recommendations do get noted at the end of our transcripts, by the way. If you oh. want to receive our transcripts Ooh. in your inbox every single week, well, as often as we release, which is usually every single week, um, you can subscribe to our sub stack. And then you'll have the complete list. <laughs> uh, on another note, we did get our first recommendation from a listener. Oh, are we going to? I thought we were going to save that for mail. Oh, we're going to save so, that? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's just acknowledge it for the moment. Yes. So, Gwen, thank you so much. I love you. I hope to see you again sometime, maybe soonish. But uh, one of our listeners sent in a very thoughtful um, mm -hmm. recommendation. And I mentioned to my wife and 
I said, you've read that book, haven't you? She said, yes, that's the one that helped me understand my husband. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you well, have to wait go. and find out what that recommendation is. So, well, mm -hmm. I, I guess the point is, for everyone else who's listening, send us a recommendation and we'll have, what, a special episode where we just work through recommendations? Yeah. Something like that? Okay. Yeah. But we need, that means we need a whole lot more. That's right. So, don't pick something we've already picked. Pick something new. Mm -hmm. And, and and let us let us know. So in the in the spirit of that, Emily, do you have oh. your own recommendation? Sure. Yeah. Um, I'm gonna actually pass on a recommendation from your wife. Um, this is a short book that I've only just begun, um, but it's called The Supper of the Lamb, mm. and it's a rejoicing in being and food and communion and the Lord, and it's delightful. And that's all I have to say about it. Okay. I have had that same book on my list recommended from various people for the past uh, four years. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a ca ca Capon? Capon, yeah. Capon. I don't I know if that's it. how you say it, but that's how I read Capon. it. Uh -huh. Capone. Capone. Uh. <laughs> no, that, that's an Italian gangster. <laughs> oh, no, not that one. <laughs> oh. So, Brian, do you have... I do. Are you just tagging on that one or do you have your own? I do have my own. Uh, my wife and I recently started uh re-watching through the show leverage uh so oh, i'm good. going to recommend that it i watched it when it came out i think she watched it on her own afterwards and mm -hmm. i don't know but now this is our first time watching it at the same time together as mm -hmm. a married couple because uh we've never watched it together before and it's really fun it's it's incredibly corny in the best ways and on purpose yeah um you you can tell that they love the genre that they are lampooning and also paying <laughs> homage to so it is it's just a it's a fun rip roaring good time mm -hmm. best episode of leverage ever no idea because i don't remember all of them and we oh, just finished okay. season one or are about to i don't quite know i liked the one about wine but that's mostly because i like wine <laughs> <laughs> Of of the first season ones that I've watched, I I think one of my favorite ones was probably the the horse racing one. Mm -hmm. mm, that because it's it, it's fun and ridiculous. It takes place in Kentucky, and it's just it's great. Elliot's probably my favorite character, so it was kind of his Elliot's episode to shine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't. My my girls could tell you exactly what season it is. I don't remember it. Maybe second, the Rushamon job. Mm, uh, yes. Oh, uh, it was the first one I saw, not even knowing what I was getting into. It was at the Farshman's house, of course, and it was on, and it just it just grabbed me. And I said, I don't know what this is or who these people are, but that was great storytelling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So wait and see when you get there. And Rem maybe reminds me of it. one of my favorite gags that I've seen from The Simpsons, which is it's like, oh, I didn't like that movie. Well, Homer, you liked Rashomon. That's not how I remember it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. oh um i have one this is a, a book a devotional book that my wife got recommended from our pastor and his wife and then i looked at it i've known of the author forever but i've never really read any of his and i started reading this and this is just a delightful wonderful spiritually nourishing book it's by martin lloyd jones hmm. Um, it's called Walking with God, Day by Day. Mm. It's a 365 daily devotional. And what they, the, whoever the uh, editors are, they've just gone into his major works and have lifted page size clips. And they've done it very artfully. So it doesn't, it never feels like it's clunkish or that it's been chopped or anything. And each one begins with a Bible verse and then about. You know, about two-thirds of the page is simply three or four paragraphs from one of his works, and it ends with a thought to ponder, which is generally the obvious thing that if you read that, oh, this is about, and yeah, oh, yeah, he <laughs> said. Uh, <clears throat> but he is, he is so warm in his theology. It's, it's theologically sound. It's, it's deep without being pedantic, without sounding like he's um, deliberately trying to play the scholar card. He's just telling us about Jesus. And uh, it begins with with Christ and with the, the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. And mm -hmm. it, it will take you all of about two minutes or so each morning just to read one page. It's designed for... Yeah, what was the title again? Walking with God. Excellent. That should do it. 
Martin Murray Jones. I so, I don't do devotional books. I, I I read theology books. I've never done devotional books, but this one has me hooked. So mm. my recommendation. Yeah. That's great. Anytime I I read something that was from Martin Lloyd Jones, it just feels like even in non audible form, you just mm. feel his Welsh accent enveloping yes. you in a hug. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, that's great. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. It's been a delight, a long delight. (laughs) Uh, Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thanks also to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Uh, If you'd like to join their number, the best way I think I can say at this point is to join our Patreon, patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. Uh, You can still use our Anchor support page, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion. Anchor is rebranding into Spotify for podcasts, and it's not been the smoothest transition, but it should still work as far as I know. Um, Other things, we already mentioned their transcripts. Uh, Thanks also to our generous transcriptionist who donates her time Mm -hmm. to type out what we say. It's it's very kind of her. Um, And she also does like uh, the abbreviated show notes at the end. So if you want our show notes, get the transcripts. That's our, our sub stack. Um, if there's a book we should read, let us know. Send us your recommendation. Our email address is haltingtowardszion at gmail.com, and we would love to hear from you. Thanks for joining us. See you next time. <laughs>